Hello and welcome to our second lecture in this course. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the Android platform. The, the full stack of the Android, um, Android programming infrastructure um, or the architecture. Um, on this screen, you see a stack of different layers. This figure is uh, taken from Wikipedia, which is an um, open source platform, as you know. Um, let me briefly talk about what we see here. So we see different layers starting from the Linux kernel at the bottom all the way to the apps at the top. And we are basically going to discuss everything about uh, this, this stack of layers in this video. Recommended reading, uh, the Android in Practice book, chapter one. It covers a lot of these details and also gives um, a background about uh, the, the discussion we are going to have. And of course, the official Android documentation, um, this particular link, as well as anything related to that. Um, yeah, let me go back a little. Um, any layer architecture um, with advanced softwares, uh, also in case of Android, uh, essentially has uh, several layers of abstraction. So the layer below um, and layer above have a relation where the layer above is an abstraction over the lower layer. In the sense, um, the users of the upper layer basically don't have to deal with the lower layer directly. They deal with the layer through whatever APIs or other function calls that are exposed to the upper layer. Uh, that's, that's the framework uh, in general and also in particular with this Android stack. For example, uh, very rarely, you would be dealing directly with any of the lower layers like say the Linux kernel. But all through these layers, appropriate APIs um, are exposed and you can do things like creating a file which are typical uh, for, a, for an operating system kernel. Right? Um, another point is, uh, as you can imagine, um, Android architecture and platform is, is essentially huge. Um, and we won't be able to cover everything but we, we, we talk about uh, bits and pieces of, uh, and, the, and the important aspects of different layers. Other things we'll explore, um, many of those uh, in different examples as we go on developing our apps and learn more about Android. And some others, uh, uh, rather many others, will be left uh, for you to explore later or on your own in some of the assignments. So the first layer, uh, the bottom most layer we are going to talk about, um, as you can see, is the Linux kernel. Um, so Android uses a version of Linux, as we'll see soon on the next slide. And uh, it, this, this particular layer supports what a typical operating system should. So it allows the users, that is uh, people who are working through any of the higher layers, to interface with the hardware, um, manage the processes, uh, deal with files, creation, uh, deletion of files, writing to files, reading from files, and so on. Similarly with network, uh, connecting to network, re releasing a network socket, um, and passing data on the network, and so on. Uh, power management, which is crucial with mobile, um, mobile devices, uh, more than say desktop or web apps in general, um, all of that is also managed at this lower level by the Linux kernel. As I was just saying, um, Android uses a modified Linux kernel. So um, it's not the general Linux that you would uh, perhaps uh, you know, find on some of the lab machines or uh, have installed on your own machine. Um, what are some modifications? Some are obvious. Uh, for example, it doesn't have the X11 windowing system um, because the graphical user interface on an Android device is totally different from what you would have on a typical desktop um, Linux machine. Um, so that, that, is, that one is perhaps very obvious. But the next one perhaps is not. So no 
uh, GNU no GNU stand, standard uh, C library is present on the Android version of Linux. Um, they have created their own C library called uh, Glib, uh, sorry, called uh, Bionic, which replaces the Glib C that you find on uh, regular Linux distributions. Um, and this Bionic is optimized for mobile devices. So that is the reason why it's so, um, but you know, there are additional efforts taken by Google to, to develop uh, this particular library and then include it using that. Um, what this means is programs that are written for uh, regular GNU Linux, um, they won't run on Android by default. They won't, uh, in most cases, just you know run uh, out of box. Uh, you'll have to compile them again against the Bionic uh, libraries and then the executable will run. So there is this additional dependency. What this also means sort of in a, in a broader frame is, you know, um, when Google started showing its interest in, in Linux and adopted it for Android, um, the open source Linux community was uh, rather excited. They had very high hopes with a big player like Google uh, entering the scenario. Um, but as Google started developing things for Android, um, they had to make certain changes which were, um, which were basically not uh, backward compatible. So those changes, they could not merge in the standard Linux kernel. And um, then there is a bifurcation from that point. So, um, you know, the, the standard Linux is developed in its own way. And then um, Android Linux, Google's Linux is developed in, uh, in it with its own dependencies and so on. One of the key reasons why uh, Linux was chosen um, is because it's 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 considered secure, and we'll see you know, what we mean by security. Um, the, so, uh, the at the core, the Linux security philosophy says uh, a resource will be protected from a resource for a user will be protected from another user. So. Linux basically prevents a user A from re reading user B's files, um, prevents, um, uh, sorry, ensures user A does not exhaust user B's memory um, and does not exhaust uh, their CPU resources or devices and so on. So that is, that is inherent to Linux. Um, we'll take a slightly deeper look at how Linux does that and then we'll come back and talk about how it's useful for Android. So, Linux basically has a user-based permission model. Many of you would be already aware with this. Here is an example of your syllabus.tech uh, file um, that I use to produce your syllabus. Um, and if you see from, so this is what you would get if you do an ls um, hyphen l um, listing on, on that particular file. And if you go from right to left, these are the main chunks in what is displayed on the terminal. So this obviously is the file name, um, syllabus.tech. Before that, in this example, you see August 12, 1632, which is the last modified timestamp. Um, the one before that, um, in perhaps many of you can already guess, is the size of the file. And now we get into the more interesting part. So the one before that, which is staff here, um, is, a, is, a, is a group. Um, users are part of different groups based on the operating system. So I'm working on a Mac OS laptop. Um, it creates a group called staff and puts the root user in that group. Um, at, uh, on, on the school network, for example, there could be groups for undergrads, then master's students, uh, then faculty, and uh, you know there could be groups with specific permissions. So the school director um, you know, would have special permissions on some files, which a faculty member like me uh, probably would not. Right? And now you can guess what this is. This is the owner, a specific user who owns this resource. Okay. And leftmost um, piece of data here is a bunch of permissions. These permissions are broken down into broadly four groups. Um, so if you count here, there are 10 
per bits uh, or 10 uh, letters that you can see, the hyphen, then R, W hyphen, um, and so on. And each of those have a meaning. So the leftmost letter or bit um, can be a hyphen or a D indicating whether this particular file is a directory. Again, a small tidbit. Um, in, in Unix, Linux-based systems, everything is a file. Um, even the directories uh, are files and they are just designated differently with the letter D in this case. Um, for this example, as you can see, syllabus.tech is not a directory and we see a hyphen um, as the leftmost bit. After that, the remaining nine bits are chunked into groups of three where they specify what are the permissions for the owner, uh, first three bits, then the group, the next three bits, and then others, anyone else on the system, um, the last three bits. And there you, you basically specify whether that particular um, entity has a read, write, or execute permission. So what we are seeing here is we have an RW hyphen. So the owner, the user whose name is Swaroop, has the read and write permission on syllabus.tech. Why not executable? Well, this is not an executable file. Um, then the next three, we see R hyphen hyphen, which means the group, the staff, only has a read permission on this. So if there are any other users who are part of the staff group, which there aren't any because this is my personal laptop, um, they can also read this file, um, but they cannot write to it. And then the last three bits are for others, so any other user on this on this particular machine, um, they also have the read permission only and no write permission. Um, there are ways to change permissions. Uh, we could set it to non unreadable for uh, the group and the um, and the others as well. Um, but this is how basically Linux uh, manages its uh, permissions for every user. Um, in addition to that, um, Linux can also support process isolation. So you know each process can run independently of the other process, and we'll see how that plays a role um, in in security for Android. Um, and in general, inter-process communication, uh, one process communicating with the other, um, has secure, extensible mechanisms, and um, you can. Um, you know, it being open source, you can remove unnecessary and what's called potentially insecure parts of the kernel, um, you know, and have it specific to the uh, to the mobile devices. So <clears throat> these are some factors which play a role in Google deciding for Linux uh, in comparison to other operating systems. So um, all Android processes um, or applications, they sort of run in an application sandbox, its own world, its own version of the operating system, if you will. And this is how it happens. So when an app is installed on the phone, so you download a new browser, let's say, uh, get a new game um, or whatever, a new social media app, the app becomes a new user for the device. So just like on the previous slide, we saw Swaroop was a user, um, the app itself becomes a user, a user account. And uh, you can perhaps imagine the next point then, only that user can access the files for that app. So only that app user has permissions at the lowest operating system level. Um, only that app user has the permissions to access files belonging to that app. So this allows for complete uh, sandboxing and then separation of resources, for example, files that are associated um, with that particular app. So something your file writes into, no other app can read it by default. Of course, that doesn't mean, um, um, that, doesn't mean that you cannot share data with other apps, that would be disastrous. Uh, it only means that um, by default, another app cannot just crawl into your space and start reading your stuff. So um, 
there are other sophisticated mechanisms to share data with other apps, and we'll 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 see how those work uh, eventually in a in a couple of weeks. Um, then the important part here is the sandbox is implemented at the kernel level, so everything, uh, all the layers above that, uh, including say the native libraries, all the way up to the applications, uh, they all run within the uh, the application sandbox okay and uh, this this provides for the security of app and their own data so that is the key point here uh, we'll come back to application sandbox when we talk about how processes are managed and how an app runs uh, in its own process um, and what that means for communicating with other apps right 